Kofi, and welcome everyone to the Invisible India podcast. Today is part two with Eliza Keaton, Ali Kuti, Malayalam learner and cultural curator. <laughs> welcome. It. Namaskaram. Nice to be here again. Yeah. We had a wonderful conversation last time about uh, what did the process of being a uh, foreign person, particularly an American, learning an Indian language, uh, what it's like to be a cultural curator of a language that you're not native to, and then just some more personal, um, I don't know, just 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 not misgivings, but <laughs> personal challenges, I guess, that we have as uh, kind of putting ourselves out there on the internet in this space. So uh, today we're going to be talking about responsibly adjusting to Indian culture, where we're both kind of at and wrestling through that. Uh, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, colonialism and uh, the place of the English language globally. So again, uh, listen to the first part to learn a little bit more about Eliza and her Instagram and uh, her, her YouTube videos and what she's trying to do to create resources for Malayalam. For those of you who know my story, I'm um, a... Hindi learner, a lifelong Hindi learner, living in India with my kids and my husband in northern India in Bihar. And uh, Eliza and I have a lot of things in common and, and some major differences too, which we talked about in the first part. So let's get into part two. One, I would say one of the more challenging things about being in a space where I'm, I'm trying to learn a new language and... For me, as I've like tested fluently in Hindi, I never want to just that be the end game for me. It's always, I always want there to be more. I always want there to be a further, um, a path ahead. And most Indian languages are so deep and so uh, incredibly rich that yes, there is a lot to learn and it will take a lifetime. So I don't know, I'm just kind of curious about your approach. I know you said that when you started, it was kind of for fun. And I don't know, what are some of your long-term goals in Malayalam? Well, I mean, we always joke, but it's not really a joke, that I want to be able to watch a Malayalam comedy movie without subtitles, because comedy is one of those things where you can't translate it out. You know, it just gets lost. Um, yeah. But in general, you know, I, as I've said before, Arjun and his family speak English fluently. Um, so it's not really about the, necess the necessity to communicate, but I think it's just about understanding the depth of the language and, and the varieties of it. And also just, why not? Why not just see what's there? Um, one interesting thing about Kerala, like many places in India, it wasn't one state before. It was like several um, kingdoms or princely states and so because of that they have such a rich diversity within their own language um, and mm. you know just because I can understand things in the Kochi dialect maybe I should learn more about something from Kazrago which is you know heavily influenced by neighboring languages or you have Trivandrum dialect which might have more Tamar influence in it so you know there's always so much more to learn about the, lo the localities and the history and you know, the different food items, the different clothing items, the different cultural things. There's just so much there. Um, I think like with any Indian culture, there's going to be that depth of history and poetry and, and things. And I don't want to be, you know, reciting, you know, Balato, you know, by heart, but I, I do want to be able to understand more of these poetic expressions in Malayalam because, you know, there are things that are used in poetry that aren't used in daily speech that have a much more meaningful impact and, and things like that. So as you said, even as an English teacher, I try to teach my students not to treat English as a transactional language. Don't use it just to buy things mm -hmm. and be a tourist and you get a job. Mm -hmm. Like live in it, have a language to live with. And so I'd like to be able to live with my other. Yes, you can definitely tell that you've learned languages before because uh, those are the learnings that I think you have once you've learned a language previously is, okay, this isn't, this hasn't just changed opportunities for me. This isn't just something to add to a resume. This has changed me. This has changed my way of seeing the world. This has changed my way of living life. And, uh, and, and you can't necessarily predict or even document those, those kind of things that, that happen or will happen and, um, 
I know for me, I've gone through a lot of changes, especially even in my worldview of, of how I see, um, you know, right and wrong, how I see uh, truth and lie, how I see, um, you know, gender roles and, and different things like that. It, it, it's, it's living in India will change a lot of things but <laughs> about you, but even when you interact with a, a language, I think you learn so much more than than what you said, just like getting a job or transacting. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the comments that you made during a, uh, a conference you were speaking at, um, contributing to like elevated perceptions of the English language. So if you could kind of run through some of that information, I will, I think it would be really interesting for our guests to hear a, a little bit of what you talked about through on um, the Women in Language conference. Well, English has an elevated status because it's become the de facto communication between companies and it's a huge industry. The English language industry is massive. I mean, if you've spent any time in Asia, um, you will see the amount of money that parents will spend to put their kids in extra tuitions, the amount of money it takes to take an IELTS exam. Um, it's just a massive business. It's, it's, oh, I can't remember if it was like 50, 55 billion dollar industry. Um, it's, it's massive and it's only growing. And the thing is when you make IELTS a requirement to apply for residency for places like Canada or the United States in order to get more points, you have to get a higher score and, you know, it just becomes very much a rat race to become a master of speaking English. And then... It goes beyond just, you know, interaction and communication, you know, you have business English, you have accent reduction classes, you have, you know, and <laughs> what happens is that in some places, English takes precedence. So like if you take Europe, for example, you're in Germany, you go to a German school, you learn English, maybe even French, maybe even Spanish, but you never get this feeling that German is a useless language. However, in India, in Kerala, for sure, you can say that English medium schools have a much higher value than Malayalam medium schools. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there becomes this value. It's, yeah, speak Malayalam, but English is better. You know, I still do get occasional comments on my page. Why are you wasting your time learning Malayalam? And so, you know, there's this, <laughs> there's this societal, you know, thing of, yeah, your language is good, but it's not good enough. And I do recognize how English mm. can help people move up socially or get a better job. But the amount of classism that comes from learning English, the amount of, you know, hierarchy that comes from your level or ability or perceived uh, pronunciation, even in the English speaking world, you know, so mm -hmm. it's, these things elevate English to the status that anything that participates in the Anglosphere is inherently more valuable. For mm -hmm. example, how many... Mm -hmm. Scientific videos do you see in local Indian languages? You don't. I have one friend, Nirmal. He has a, a, a series, um, a YouTube channel called Scientific Thummerins. And he's like the only guy I know that sits there and will explain evolution in Thummer, you know, but we don't have that in other languages. If you want to be able to present mm, a paper no. at a international scientific forum, you need to present your paper in English. Um, right. So there, there are just so right. many of these things that we don't think about, but yes, the world focuses on English, emphasizes English, and in many ways subtly tells people your language is not as important. Mm -hmm. It's very, fun. it's very interesting that there, there are a couple of countries who have somehow managed to get around that. I would say two that I've noticed would be uh, Brazil and China, where there there is actually vocabulary for all of these things, right? There is actually vocabulary for, for everything. They don't just throw English in. And so it, it's interesting. I think that, um, you know, Britain, I, I wonder if it's because, you know, language does, in Brazil was developed like post, uh, like when Brazil was colonized. And then for China, obviously having never been colonized. It, it's just interesting how that kind of plays a role. It's interesting though. In all it's that, interesting but. though, because we talk about English, but English is not the only evil in this case. You know, you brought up China, which is a really interesting sure. example because there are so many linguistic communities in China that have just been steamrolled out of existence. Uh, Brazil, yes. you have all these indigenous communities, you know? So um, even yes. Arabic, 
has steamrolled through pre-Arabic you know, languages that mm-hmm. exist maybe still in Yemen or, or southern Oman. So, mm. you know, there is a linguistic hierarchy and the accent or dialect of whatever oh, language yeah. you speak does have a precedence. So I don't want to say like English bad, but English is definitely the biggest contender in this kind of. And I think that's why European languages have been able to kind of sit at an equal level to English because they all have this kind of past where they have gone elsewhere and pushed mm. things out. Thank you.